and turn to Jeremiah. Book of Jeremiah, chapter 5. We haven't spent much time in Jeremiah, have we? Jeremiah 5. Jeremiah 5. Roam to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and look now, and take note, and seek in her open squares if you can find a man, if there is one who does justice, who seeks truth, then I will pardon her. And although they say, as the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. O Lord, do not your eyes look for truth? You have smitten them, but they did not weaken. You have consumed them, but they refused to take correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to repent. Then I said, they are only the poor, they are foolish, for they do not know the way of the Lord or the ordinance of their God. I will go to the great and will speak to them, for they know the way of the Lord and the ordinance of their God. But they too, with one accord, have broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Therefore, a lion from the forest shall slay them. A wolf from the deserts shall destroy them. A leopard is watching their cities. Everyone who goes out of them shall be torn to pieces because their transgressions are many. Their apostasies are numerous. Why should I pardon you, you, your sons have forsaken me, and sworn by those who are not gods? When I had fed them to the full, they committed adultery and trooped to the harlot's house. They were well-fed, lusty horses, each one neighing after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not punish these people, declares the Lord? And on a nation such as this, I shall not avenge myself. Go up through her vine rows and destroy, but do not execute a complete destruction. Strip away her branches, for they are not the Lord's. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously with me, declares the Lord. We can stop there. We're in John chapter 11, we're going to finish John chapter 11, but we need to go back a little bit and refresh, back to Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Back in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus had cast a demon from a man who was blind and dumb. There was no way to communicate with the demon in the man because of his physical afflictions. By their own understanding, their own tradition, when Messiah comes, Messiah will be able to do this. And Jesus did it. And they said, wait, wait. Hang on here. We think it's only by the power of Satan that you can do this. And so Jesus <coughs> pronounced the unpardonable sin upon the generation of Israel. And after, after that, it says in Matthew 12, 38, some of the scribes and Pharisees so, well, let's hold on. Let's not be hasty. Teacher, we just want to see a sign from you. Just, just give us a sign that you are the Messiah, and that's all we need is one more sign. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, 
and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The sign that they will receive is the resurrection. And Arnold Fruchtenbaum says that they received that sign in three phases. The first phase was the resurrection of Lazarus. It doesn't exactly fit because Lazarus was dead four days. This was actually another messianic miracle. Only Messiah can raise someone from the dead who's been in the tomb for four days. Maybe less than four days. Maybe somebody else could do that, but not four days. And it says in John 11.45 that many of the Jews, does John just simply mean Judeans, or does he mean some of the Jewish leadership? Maybe a little of both. John is a little bit unclear. But it says that many of the Jews who came to Mary, so they were grieving with Mary. They were people who knew Mary. And saw what he had done, some of them believed in him. Some believed, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. It says that therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we doing? Or we would probably say, what are we going to do about this? This man is performing many signs. They acknowledge that he's performing signs. These are miraculous signs. They are not disagreeing that the signs are real. But they've already made their judgment. <coughs> He's doing these by the power of Satan. What are we doing? If we let him go on like this, all men will <coughs> believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. What was their their place? Well, they were they were the religious leaders. And they, they had a uh, political structure, the nation of Israel, which uh, functioned as a vassal of the Roman Empire at the time. But it, you know, it was better than nothing. In fact, it was kind of a cozy relationship. They got protection from the Roman government. The Roman government kept the peace, kept them in their place as religious leaders. It kind of reminded me of that story that I refer to a lot back in Genesis, Genesis 11 4, the what we call the Tower of Babel incident. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city. See, that's number one. Let us build for ourselves a political structure and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. Actually, it should say whose top is under the heavens, meaning a temple to whatever gods they wanted to worship. Those two things, the political structure, the religious structure. Let's build it ourselves that we may make a name for ourselves through these two elements. Otherwise, we'll be, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. It had nothing to do with him. He was not honored in any of it. They were doing this all on their own. And that's really what the story of the book of Revelation really is. Man's 
political and religious structures destroyed to make way for God's kingdom. But it says that one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. In other words, this is bigger than any of you think. Nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. And John tells us he did not say this of his own initiative, that he was saying this by the Holy Spirit. Being high priest that year, he <coughs> prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, for the sins of the nation of Israel, for their sins. And not for the nation of Israel only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Gathering together, Monica. I'm trying to figure out why Caiaphas would say that. He wasn't feeling God moving him to say anything, but he was saying words that we understand were quite prophetic. Right, he, he had a, a meaning that was a uh, an immediate meaning, you know, the more permanent solution to our problem, as the song says. Uh, but it had uh, universal ramifications. So the problem, was he thinking like, well, we'll just get rid of him and that'll placate the Romans for a while and they'll get off our back? Is that what he was thinking? Well, if you remember that Pilate really didn't want to uh, go through with this. Pilate did not want to crucify Jesus. Uh, this was all the instigation of the, uh, uh, the, the Jewish leaders. If it hadn't been for that, uh, Pilate wouldn't have done it. So, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, it's just that uh, Caiaphas says this in relevance to their immediate situation. But John is telling us that it's bigger than that. And Caiaphas spoke more than he knew because God honored his position even if he was a uh, Yeah. There you go. He was a dirty no good Nick. Back in the early chapters of John, it says that the Messiah came unto his own, his own people, Israel, and his own did not receive him. And it says, so from that day on, they planned together to kill Jesus. Therefore, Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there he stayed with his disciples, uh, probably over by the Jordan River, kind of to the southeast a little bit of Jerusalem. Remember that uh, Jerusalem is only 15 miles from the Jordan River. So it's it's a walk that uh, somebody in decent shape can do in a day. I probably used to could do that, walk that distance in a day, but we're going to see next week that Jesus, at a certain point in time, sets out. He goes through Jericho, and he enters the city with all of the fanfare that is due the arriving king, but then he disappears. It says in John eleven fifteen. now the Passover of the Jews was near. That's important to mark. Remember the Passover, the celebration of the Jews' 
uh, leaving Egypt the night before the last plague visited them, uh, visited Egypt, uh, the death of the firstborn. But with the blood on, of the lamb on the doorpost and the lintel of their houses, the angel of death would pass over. Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up to Jerusalem out of the country before the Passover to purify themselves. So they were seeking for Jesus and were saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think? That he will not come to the feast at all? That you and I probably wouldn't, you know. You would know what was waiting for us. Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he, where he was, he was to report it so they might seize him. And we know that indeed they did after Jesus celebrated the Passover with his apostles, that he was seized, uh, that he was tried six times uh, that he was had wit false witnesses presented against him uh, he was unlawfully prosecuted uh, and sentenced to death that was his accomplishment he intended to do that he embraced all of it there are a number of very uh, ancient uh, poems written about Jesus as the, the hero of the story, the one who wrestles with the concept of death and overcomes, overpowers. But what he accomplished was the wages of sin is death. Our wages were paid to him. But he also released us from the law. Because the law is, as Paul explains, the law is good and yet it is to our detriment. In Romans 7.1, so I'm taking a little excursion here. Romans 7, 1, Paul says, Do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? If we consider ourselves living, we are under the law. In the example he gives, the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. The marriage contract is broken uh, upon death. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she'll, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law. When we accept Christ, when we receive Christ, we receive his attributes. Remember, like uh, 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 Martin Luther said, it's, it's like a marriage with community property. Everything that he has, everything we have, all our sin and corruption he takes and all the glory uh, and everything good that he has becomes ours. One of the things that he has that he bestows upon us is that he has died. So we become uh, legally dead. Isn't that cool? Love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm legally dead. As far as the law is concerned, we're dead because we have received that position 
from Christ. You were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which we were which were aroused by the law, were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit, and not in oldness of the letter. The letter of the law. Remember, Paul says that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. What shall we say then? Verse 7. Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. You know, how, many, how many of us think of ourselves as covetous? I guess Paul really wrestled with that. He didn't seem to wrestle with the others, but you know, you can be covetous and not really think much about it. The fact that the law says thou shalt not covet caused Paul some trouble. That's when he realized that, oh, that applies to me. He says, but sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting. In fact, he says, when, when I uh, started reading the law, I became more covetous than I was before. And I recognized it. I saw it in myself. It produced in me coveting of every kind, for apart from the law, sin is dead. And he says, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. The law is, although it's a good thing, it reveals the mind of God. Uh, its brilliance is too much for us. We can't take it. You know, we, we have this uh, philosophy, you know, I used to hear it a lot more than I do now, but, you know, people would say, well, I believe humans are basically good. Well, we're not. That's, you know, that's one of the things we have to come to uh, realize is, you know, uh, b before we, uh, we come to the Lord is that we're not basically good. In fact, there's nothing in us. That is good. We'll see that in a minute. Well, that's kind of what we were seeing in Jeremiah that we just read. But Paul says, I was once alive apart from the law. You know, when I was a child and unaware of the law, I was alive. But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. And this, this is one of the areas where we discern an age of accountability, by the way. Uh, and this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. And therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin. We're not basically good. We're basically sinful. We're basically rebellious against God's provision. We don't really want it in our natural state. It was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. He goes on, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, 
sold into bondage to sin. You know, that was one of the results of the sin of Adam and Eve is that we were sold into bondage to sin. We were sold to the devil. You know, we hear about the devil tempting people. He really doesn't have to. He's, you know, we're, we're born into his kingdom. Sold into bond, we, you know, we can, the scripture that jumps out at me is when Satan takes Jesus to a high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world at a glance and says, these have been handed over to me. I can give them to whoever I want. I'll give them to you if you just worship me. Go according to my plan, and I'll give them all to you. They've been handed over to me. Paul says, for what I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. That's our big dilemma, where we do the very things we know we should not do. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin, which dwells in me. The devil made me do it. No, the sin dwelling in me made me do it. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. We might have a will to do good. But the doing of the good is not. Isaiah says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. This is the fate, the condition of all of us. Paul says, for the good I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. The law is good, but I am not. That's our problem. Paul says, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? This is the point we all need to come to, that we are wretched, blind, and naked. We have nothing that God wants, and he owes us nothing. Most of the world religions basically teach some form of works, that if we do uh, as much good work in the world as we can, uh, and at the end, our good works need to balance against our evil works. And if we're just slightly tipped to the good, then we get to go to the good place. In Hinduism, that is nothing. You get nothing. You get to escape the physical world, and you get to nothing. Nirvana, which means nothing. That's the best you get. If after you've gone through countless lifetimes and you know come back over and over again to uh, you know let's try this again, you get nothing. But Paul says, "Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord." Thanks be to God. Amen. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. 
that Jesus accomplished our redemption. He paid the price of our lawlessness, our law-breaking. C.S. Lewis wrote a story called The Great Divorce, and I think I've encouraged some of you to read it. It's one of his greatest books, and uh, you can read it uh, in an evening if you're pretty good, and two evenings if you're a little bit slow like me. You know, I really, I have ADD, really kind of bad. So I was uh, in a counseling class, and we were, you know, in counseling, you have to pair up and tell each other your problems and counsel each other. You know, how would you counsel a situation? And then sitting there going through this, you know, being interviewed by my, uh, my partner, and the professor is sitting right next to us, you know, this professors do, listening in. And she says, you're severely ADD. And there's really nothing that this counseling is going to do for you. And I said, well, I'm, you know, 65 years old. I've made it through this far. I'm just going to let it go. Uh, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lewis's story. The paradigm of the story is that he, uh, the, the uh, main character, which you don't even ever find out his name, but it, essentially it's him. It's his own dream thoughts. Uh, he gets into all, he finds himself in hell, which is not a place of, uh, you know, caves and fire and uh, as he puts it, interesting people roasting on grids. It's more of a gray, uh, rainy town with shuttered up shops, uh, you know, kind of like Detroit. But he's wandering around this uh, town and he, you know, encounters a group of people that are kind of waiting in line. And uh, he asks a little bit about What's, what are we waiting for? Well, we're going to get on the bus, you know, the bus. Well, in the story, the people in hell, those who will stand in line, get to get on the bus and get to the edge of heaven, which turns out to be a, a very park-like place. And they get off the bus, and uh, they're met by somebody they knew in their natural life on earth. And it's, he recounts some of their stories of these people that get off the bus on the edge of heaven. And it says that one of the ghosts, that's what he calls the people from hell, one of the ghosts who boarded the bus to heaven is approached by an old employee of his from earth, who is now a spirit in heaven. The ghost of hell is surprised that his former employee made it to heaven, insisting instead that he deserved to make it there, that he deserved to be there. He says, i gone straight all my life, the ghost explains. I don't say I was a religious man, and I don't say I had no faults, far from it, but I've done my best all my life, see? I've done my best by everyone. That's the sort of chap I was. I never asked for anything that wasn't mine by rights. And the ghost repeats with insistence that he only wants his rights. He is not asking for special treatment or handouts. He only wants what he deserves. The spirit assures the ghost that he would receive something far better than what he deserves. In fact, the spirit says he has not gotten his rights either, for if he had, he would not be in heaven. The ghost simply does not understand and continues, continues blabbering about rights. What do you keep on arguing for? I'm only telling you the sort of chap I am. I only want my rights. I'm not asking for anybody's bleeding charity. The spirit is quick to respond. Then do, at once. Ask for the bleeding charity. Everything is here for the asking and nothing can be bought. It is not by rights that we may enter here, for none of us may claim a right to the Lord's kingdom. Not one of us deserves it. 
It is by grace, by the Lord's bleeding charity, that we might be granted permission to enter. Jesus Christ showed us this bleeding charity on Calvary, where he opened the gates of heaven by his death and purchased for us the reward of eternal life. It's a gift that he freely gives us. None of us deserve it, but we are free to accept. Amen. Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. So, we really only have one choice to make. Do we want what we deserve? No? Or do we want what's offered? We want the charity, the grace that God offers. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for uh, just the, the wonders that you have provided by your grace. And Lord, we, we know that we are not going to come to your kingdom by any uh, political machinations or by uh, uh, most of what goes under the name of religion. Uh, Lord, you desire us, and yet you owe us nothing. And Lord, we have nothing, and few of us desire you. We pray, Lord, that uh, Lord, we pray that your church experiences revival and that your uh, that revival spreads to the unbelieving world. Lord, we're just thankful that you have saved us and promised a life with you. We're thankful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.